Okay, you know, and we've got quorum, so we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez, Chair of Public Safety Committee, and today is the meeting for Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you would please call the roll. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez. Present. Council Member O'Farrell. Council Member Buscaino. Here. Council Member Rue. Present. Council Member Lee. Present. Very good. And Council Member O'Farrell, present also. Okay. Then that's everyone. Terrific. We're all here. Um, Mr. Clerk, if you would please announce uh, the call in information for uh, the public that wishes to speak on any items on today's agenda. Certainly. Uh, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1 669 254 5252 and then use meeting ID number 161. 586-7607, and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for the participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And uh, so at this time, I want us to go ahead and take uh, items for public comment. And so speakers, when uh, when you're called on, when you're uh, allowed to speak, would you please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on? First caller. Uh, yeah, hi, it's uh, Daniel Gus. I just want to make general public comment, please. Okay, so you will have one minute. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, council members, I have a column, as I mentioned, at, um, at City Watch LA. I mentioned this during my... City Council comment uh, period earlier today, you have a scandal brewing at the LAPD. It has calamitous potential, and especially Mr. Rue should pay attention since he's the one who's calling out corruption. The LAPD right now is engaged in a cover-up involving misconduct by an elected official. The LAPD is hiding records. You need to get on this right away. Otherwise, the rest of city council will be a party to the cover-up. Please pay attention to the, to the column that I have in City Watch, published last night. It's out today. It's actually most read today. You have a scandal brewing at the LAPD. You have corruption going on here insofar as the LAPD is not releasing computer-assisted dispatch records. Now, why would the LAPD not want Thank me you, to Mr. know Gus, where your certain time is concluded. Speaker, would you please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on? Yes, uh, Wayne, from Messina, all items and general public comment. Okay, you have three minutes. Go ahead. All right. So first of all, number two, Maria Lucalache is replacing the dearly departed Sandra Figueroa. Sandra Figueroa was a cancer on the police commission. And also she was very, very fat. So remember, don't overeat sugary items. And don't vote in favor of police officers beating my fellow black man, or you will be cursed by Jesus with cancer like that fucking cunt was. So get on there and do the news thing. I don't hear you behind me talking. It's my time. All right, thank you. Now, we have ourselves the administrative code. Number three, emergency services. You want to increase the life support fees, you motherfuckers, you blood sucker, dirty FBI targets like Maury Goldman. 
How dare you in a pandemic charging for more services for people who need an ambulance? You greedy, blood-sucking, Jew nigger motherfuckers on this campus. How dare you even sit on that horseshoe with that bullshit? You have also here number four, the city attorney. Well, city attorney is the one that helped Maury Goldman. Why is he still there? Because you too dumb to realize that the FBI has got you all on the list to be indicted real soon. And I heard some fool. Is that what I heard? There's a scandal at the LAPD. Well, I'll tell you a better one. Did you know that I was in my car March 30th, 2017, Miss Rodriguez, and that Mr. Garcetti's deputy called the CHP who called the LAPD to swat me and try to have me assassinated in the parking lot over there. That's Bob Bourbon Field because it was in Canoga Park and Mr. Field was there in person. That's why the FBI is on your asses because you tried to murder a civilian under color of authority. So you go there, Monica, you keep eating. You go there, John Lee, you keep waiting for your identity papers, Mr. S- Mr. Staffer number B. You go wait there, Buscaino on Sea Breeze. And Mitchell Fell, you wait for your boyfriend to come home and say, why don't you clean the underpass of the one? Thank you, your time is up. Callers, please speak, uh, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello, caller. Okay, caller is on. Is there any others? Oh, one more. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Thank you. It's Eric Previn, and I'd like to speak on all items uh, briefly. Okay. Mr. Previn, you have two minutes plus one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Okay. So I, I wanted to express concern for everybody's you know, individual safety. It's terrifying when people do what the scary thing that was done to Melinda Abdullah. I don't know exactly what was done, if it was this kind of pranking going on that draw law enforcement to their house. I know that there's been a lot of, you know, movements and people who have been showing up at individuals' homes, and that puts pressure on public officials, you know, on the one hand. On the other hand, it is obviously uh, a tactic that can be scary and frightening, you know, possibly for all involved. Um, But the real question, I think, is an alignment of what is going on here, because it's very nice that the city is investigating this on behalf of, to make sure that because, you know, partners being partners, but... Partnering with Herb Wesson and Nuri Martinez and yourselves is a very different kind of partnership than I think the public understands going forward with respect to changes and reforms regarding the policing and the LAPD in Los Angeles. And I I feel like Melinda Abdullah is a great leader. Patrice Cullors is a great leader, one I know. And I, I just would hope that they would understand that supporting someone like Herb Wesson, who every single day looks away from unspeakable civil rights violations, not just against uh, people of color, but all members of the public. It's just appalling. He reduces everybody to the size of hashtag Blumenfield's nose, which is completely unwarranted, and people, good people, of fine, upstanding character simply look away, and he takes the heat, so that makes him a great leader. That, to me, makes him uh, worthy of consideration for being unelected forthwith. So I don't know what to say. I know that you're all trying to make sense of these complicated matters, uh, but you can't make sense of these matters when there's a fundamental disrespect for the people. And that's been something that Nuri Martinez, your great leader, knows about. And certainly David Rue is uh, savvy enough to realize that by augmenting the size of everybody who's running for your incumbent seats and reducing everybody else, including challengers, it's completely unthinkable on a day when President Trump, who's a nudnik, wants to stand in front of the White House during his uh, campaign yeah. Now for my general public comment. Go ahead. The general public comment, I'm going to be very um, specific. 
we have neighborhood councils, and neighborhood councils have, uh, you know, little groups of people who come to the meetings and participate uh, in the committees. One committee was focused on transparency and accountability, and the leader of our neighborhood council, without putting it on the agenda, decided that he no longer wanted that kind of a committee, and he did so without really discussing it with our board or with our community. And that was essentially a political hit. And in his place, uh, in the place of the widely regarded watchdog and critic, uh, Randy Freed stuck a woman named Lois Weinsaft, who grew out of the Zevier Oslovsky momentum. Previn, and I must tell you. Mr. Previn, your time's up. Thank you very much. Caller? Hi, caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello? Okay. David Brown doing a good job, Annie. Doing a good job. Yeah. Okay. Hi, caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Okay. That concludes general public comment, colleagues. And uh, I would like to uh, recommend that we approve on consent items one, three through five, and seven and eight. And uh, unless there are any objections. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a question on five. Okay, we can hold item five. So this would be items, uh, then recommending item one, three, four, seven and eight on consent. And uh, seeing no other objections, uh, Mr. Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. Council Member Rue. Aye. Council Member Lee. One more time, Mr. Lee. Council Member Lee. We can't hear you. He says yes. I can there see him, but thumbs up <laughs> gesture indicating yes. <laughs> He's got to reboot his audio. Okay. There we go. I can barely hear you. Thank you. Uh, so those items are adopted, and now that brings us to uh, item number two. Item two, communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Maria Lou Calanche to the Board of Police Commissioners for the term ending June 30th, 2022. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Calanche? Can you see me? There you are. Yeah. Hi, good to see you. Hi. Uh, Hello, everybody. And so, uh, you know, you've uh, obviously been uh, come highly recommended, uh, and uh, as, as uh, the mayor has been very thoughtful and judicious about his appointment to this very important commission, in particular during these uh, during these times, I think it's very important that uh, you understand and uh, the full breadth of responsibility that comes with this position and the demands uh, that come with that. But uh, I've had the benefit of knowing you and your work and your commitment to both uh, advocating for youth to make sure that they don't fall in a path uh, to engaging in law with law enforcement, but more importantly, even uh, the very difficult path of uh, balancing and uh, assuring accountability with respect to law enforcement and its engagement with the community. But uh, I'd like an opportunity for you to please introduce yourself to my colleagues and uh, talk uh, a little bit about your interest with respect to serving on the police commission. Sure, um, thank you so much and good afternoon council members. Again, my name is Maria Lu Calanche. I've been a resident of Los Angeles my entire life and have dedicated my life's work, my professional work, to, um, to serve young people, whether it's uh, as a professor um, at East LA College or as the executive director of Legacy LA, which serves very um, at-risk youth living in Ramona Gardens, which is 
a place that's very um, important to me because that's where I grew up, and I and I still have a lot of connection to the community and family that live there. Um, public safety is probably one of the most important issues that um, I would say all all LA residents um, think about or care about. But I think it's even more important in communities of color because there isn't always a lot of trust between law enforcement. And, um, and I would say even like young people or residents um, worked um, very, very hard to build those bridges between um, law enforcement and young people. A lot of the solutions, a lot of the work that I focused on has been developed by young people and by giving them the voice and the power to solve a lot of the problems that they face or a lot of the obstacles that they face. And one of them is you know, how to interact in a positive way with law enforcement and how to get law enforcement to interact in a positive way with them. I um, hope that um, my work on the police commission will focus on youth and amplifying the voices of young people. Um, but as I mentioned, young people have a lot of the, the answers. We just always um, have a difficult time um, communicating with young people. Sometimes it can be a little bit more radical, but that's kind of what we need sometimes in order to move the needle. I, I take this position seriously, and actually it's an honor and a privilege to be able to serve my city, a city that I care about, and to serve the residents and to be a voice for my community and other communities of color. I will um, pledge to be fair and to hear all sides of an issue and to really give it my all. I believe that um, my trajectory and my life work has shown that if I do something, I do it 150% in order to make an impact. And this is a distinct honor. I am so grateful to Mayor Garcetti for thinking of me and nominating me and putting the trust of the city. Um, in me and um, to be part of one of five um, commissioners. And I look forward to working with LAPD. I already have a lot of established relationships with LAPD and a lot of projects that we're working on. So I look forward to working on bigger you know, policy changes and, um, and you know, creative solutions to some of the hardest issues that we face as Angelinas. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Um, could you talk a little bit and share, uh, obviously, during this very pivotal time in our city's history, the work of youth development and the work that you're leading with respect to youth development and how that informs uh, and how that will inform the work of, uh, of uh, how to reform LAPD? Sure. Um, you know, a lot of our, our um Young people will tell you that public safety means um, investing in young people. We always tend to, um, I mean, growing up in Ramona Gardens, whenever there was issues with young people, um, the answer was always suppression and investment in suppression. And things haven't changed <laughs> um, since I was growing up there. I mean, the kids still face the same issues. Um, so we have the last 10 years invested a lot in youth development through Legacy LA and have seen a lot of young people change their, their lives, you know, path. Whether it be kids getting into college or a young person who was gang involved, you know, changing their lives. But it takes a lot of investment. And through, um, and there is a, a direct connection with, um, you know, policing and law enforcement and youth development. I think that, you know, one of the things that we also can, um, can look at is not just the investment on the front end, but it does reduce, you know, some of the negative interactions between um, law enforcement and um, and young people. Communication is improved. Um, um, the, you know, one of the projects that we're working on is called Our Eyes, which works with, it was created by young people that um, work to improve communications between um, law, the police officers that work in their community and the kids that always see um, law enforcement in a negative light. So that is a youth development program. It's leadership building. It's a building their capacity to, to solve solutions, to lead change. So um, we, um, I'm part of the Invest in Youth campaign, which is focused on investing um, in comprehensive youth development versus you know, youth development that is focused on um, punitive, I would say, um, or like you have to be um, 
super at risk to receive city services. We're thinking, you know, all the youth are at risk that are growing up poor and, you know, and don't have resources. So it's really important that we invest in a, uh, comprehensively in, in youth and their families um, in order to have to invest so much in suppression. So there is a direct connection, and I think that the city's on a good path to create, you know, the city's first youth development department, um, which I'm really grateful for the councilwoman to kind of push, you know, pushing this along. But I believe that um, with with investment in young people, you'll see policing change as well. There's a direct connection, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Lunch. And I know that's something that you know my colleague John Lee, who's been active with the PALS in his area is also very familiar with, and Mr. Buscaino, with your work historically, uh, some of those very same youth that you mentored, you see a transformation and a reduction in the interaction uh, that is required with law enforcement when we make those positive investments on the, on the early end. Um, so I want to thank you for that work. But I do want to open it up to my colleagues for, uh, to uh, ask any questions. So, uh, Thank you. If I can, Mr. Madam Chair. Joe yes. Buscaino, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez and, and Ms. Calanche. I'm inspired and excited um, uh, about this appointment because um, from, you know, this committee, um, when we talk about youth development, youth outreach, it's in our DNA from uh, the chairwoman, Mr. Lee's involvement in PALS and what I've done as a senior lead with our, our teen advisory panels. So we have been uh, thirsting for uh, a commissioner who can carry on our mission. Are you committed to that? Absolutely. I already see um, ways that we can engage young people in the commission to have a voice on the commission and to help us solve some of the city's like tough issues when it comes to young people um, and in the, their interactions with um, law enforcement. Um, yeah, I'm totally committed. I'm actually excited about um, when I talked to our youth yesterday. My our youth leaders, inter, you know, had to schedule a meeting with me because they wanted to know um, what this meant, what this meant for legacy, what this meant for them that I was going to be on the police commission, and um, they're excited. They're excited about having access to a police commissioner, um, a, a commissioner that knows how to talk to young people, that believes in the in the power that young people have, and how creative they are. Um, and how they can, you know, help me change. So we need to engage them in change. So I'm totally... The reason why, no, I appreciate that response. The reason why I ask is because uh, you need always need that driving force, right, whether it's at the police station or on, on an appointed or elected level. Uh, I, I've seen, um, you know, we, we started the, the teen advisory panels, which includes teenagers, the problem solved with the police department, and working, the beat, working as, on the streets, I was tired of, um, kids and teenagers giving me the, the one finger wave, right? Where, um, where we said, I'm, I'm tired of putting them in the back of my police car, but I'd rather have them in the front of my police car in partnership. Um, and today we, I think about Sergeant Plows, who's retiring over 30 years. We're on it. We just entered a, a resolution today in council. Yeah. And she, um, you, you need those supervisors at, at the police station also to, who embrace these initiatives. Um, so I'm hopeful that you can carry this on to all of our police stations, find that driving force uh, to ensure that we problem solve with teenagers. They understand uh, our youth. They understand why police officers do what they do because clearly you're finding um, now in, in recent months um, a lot of uh, public um, angst and um, public opposition to including um, youth to work with LAPD. Um, so please continue to lead that effort uh, on the commission. Um, what um, what are your thoughts on the um, the LAPD's um, um, community safety partnership? As you know, recent news: um, the mayor, along with Chief Moore, has expanded this citywide, and we're happy to see now a bureau that's been formed. Uh, can you give me your your thoughts on that? And, and you know, the CSP program was born out of uh, a housing development. So can you share your thoughts uh, on our CSP? Sure. I actually have personal experience um, working with CSP. We, um, Ramona Gardens was one of the original CSP sites. Um, I see a lot of potential in the CSP program. It's a great model. 
I hope that could be one of the issues that I work on as well because I believe in, in the model. Um, but I also believe that um, one of the, the concerns that I had, and I'm just being honest, is that every CSP site was different, which was good, but it had different goals and it was difficult to track success. You know, what, you know, what is it a measure of success? Um, there was a lot of, um, and these are things that the community brought up. So I'm sharing, I'm sharing information from my community. Um, structurally, there's a need to, to maybe um, have them available more, you know, more hours in the community. So there's lots of little things that can be worked on. But I believe in, in design, it's a great model to, to begin to um, develop relationships where law enforcement is part of the solution, but not just in policing, but in, in community development. So when, you know, working to reach the long-term goals of a community, so it's a great model, and I hope to spend a lot more time with um, Deputy Chief um, Tangerides, um to work closely with her to uh, see what, what support I can bring to it. And Mr. Eddo's on the call. I see him here. Uh, Harry, if you don't mind sharing uh, with Ms. Galanche the UCLA um, report that came out, the study from the School of Le Lefkin School of Leadership, uh, that um, scientifically proven model that CSP does work, um, love for you to share that um, with, with Lou. Um, and lastly, if I can, Madam Chair, Lou, you understand our police officers have been demoralized. I'm mm -hmm. very concerned about uh, the morale of the LAPD. I've seen it. I've spent a lot of time in the last few months um, in roll calls, on ride-alongs. Um, I uh, Can you share with me what you plan on doing to help lift the spirits of the LAPD uh, men and women who are working very hard to respond to calls of service and at the same time battling the, the whole effort in this country. Um, folks are trying to decimate police agencies, defund police agencies, whatever that means. Uh, I'd just like to hear from you, what do you plan on do, what do you plan on doing on reaching out to um, our angels in the city of angels out in the police station. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's huge. Um, well, I um, have a lot of police officer friends and colleagues that I work with. Um, so I hear, you know, um, about how they're feeling, right? And some of them are like, should we just leave? And I'm like, no, hang in there. And um, I think that um, what the role, honestly, like I feel like the commission can, can even have a role in lifting morale. I, I operate, you know, everything I do is based on like a vision for the future, whether it's like founding my organization or, or thinking about, you know, some of the, you know, on the ground, you know, community change efforts that I've led. And I would love to see the, the vision moving forward. And I think that the, uh, the officer on the street, if they understand you know, the vision for our city and the role they play in that vision and whether it means like now they're not responding to, you know, homeless, you know, homelessness or cleaning up, um, homeless encampments, but it means building relationships by spending more time with community. But I think that we, we need to be clear about what the vision is for, for public safety and policing so that we're all on board, we're all speaking the same language, um, they um, are hearing a united kind of, um, a united um, message from, you know, the city council, the mayor, the commission, that not only serves police officers, but also serves our community and ensures that our community believes that we're all working together and, and sure. Yeah, so, I, you know, I mean, knowing very well, I mean, I'm not even on the commission yet, but, you know, I just feel like we need, you know, to know where we're going. And what are we I appreciate, the I appreciate that. And I just want to remind everyone on the call that uh, the reason why we have Ms. Kalanche is here is because of the reforms in place. I'm just baffled by knowing that other agencies across this country are not, don't even have a civilian oversight yeah. commission. I was just on the phone yesterday with a dear friend through my NLC um, um, connections with um, Council President of Columbus, Ohio, Sh Shannon Hardin, who doesn't, I mean, they're now looking at these types of reforms. Let's be mindful, LAPD is 10 years ahead of other agencies across this country as it relates to reform to have 
a civilian oversight committee commission that you are running the police agency, a okay. civilian oversight commission. So thank Thanks. you so much. Yeah, Thanks. no pressure, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, if you look at the org chart of the LAPD, it's the police commission, and then below the police commission is uh, Chief Chief Michael Moore. So he, uh, you are his direct report. Um, so I appreciate you taking on this role in, in times of of just um, unprecedented times and where law enforcement lies in our city, in our region, our state, in our country. Um, but I, I know you are, your heart's in the right place. Um, and you love the city. You love your community. I'm happy to see you coming out of one of our housing developments. Uh, I wish you luck. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to move on this recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Buscano. I believe Mr. O'Farrell, did you... Yes, uh, th thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Colonche, for agreeing to volunteer on this most important commission at this most important time, uh, and as Mr. Buscaino conveyed extremely well, uh, the, um, the morale issue, um, the reckoning that's happening across the country and certainly here in Los Angeles as well, and for also... Uh, daylighting uh, the fact that uh, the Los Angeles Police Department is heads and shoulders above the rest of the country in terms of reforms uh, for policing. And I'm hopeful that the environment will uh, be such that we can really have great conversations about um, how we can bring the kind of change that people are demanding by marching in the streets uh, but also to talk about the successes and the directions that we can head collectively uh, to make our neighborhoods safer and uh, to also uh, keep working on the, on the really clear success in making sure that our police department are reflective of the constituencies that they serve. And I think it, it's a point of pride that we have around 70% of the LAPD are uh, made up of people of color and women. And so we have made great strides, and, and the police department does look like Los Angeles. Uh, and so that story can get told, and we don't need to sacrifice um, all the progress uh, for the sake of moving forward in, in newer ways and improved ways. And so, um, like you mentioned, I've been making the round, and I'm going to continue that, um, that dialogue. Um, and... Ms. Colonche, I think your, your life experience and your professional experience are such a perfect fit for this, and I'm grateful. I'm just grateful that you are bringing to the core your experience and your knowledge and your respect for um, public safety, your respect for neighborhoods, and your deep understanding um, of communities that haven't always felt like they have a seat at the table and especially our youth. I think that's of particular importance. Um, I'm a big believer in the PALS program, and I work directly with the Hollywood PALS. And, um, to see the interaction that the police officers have with local youth that otherwise would never imagine that they could even exist in the same world, well, that breaks down the barriers uh, and is so helpful uh, to build the community. And then our cadet program. I hope you'll also lean in into the cadet program because that's a wonderful, um, I think, way for kids in neighborhoods. And I've seen it. I've seen kids grow up in the cadet program that I had met when they were children knocking on doors, when I was knocking on doors in neighborhoods that have been historically neglected. And I've seen the cadet program take a 10-year-old kid up to college uh, and help that kid be put on a, a footing for a very successful life when they otherwise may not have. So um, I love your focus on you. I love it so much. Uh, I think that's going to be key moving forward. And, and that will also shed light on, uh, on a better way forward uh, for our neighborhoods. In terms of policing, in terms of public safety, um, so I think you're going to be a real bridge builder, and 
I just, again, express my gratitude for you stepping up and bringing your experience uh, to the proceedings uh, to the benefit of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Uh, and I just want to say that you know how much. You should probably there you go, John. How much we appreciate. How much we appreciate anybody uh, willing to step up and, and serve this role in our in our in our in our city. And that uh, we know that it's um, an extremely, as Councilman Bustrana said, how proud we are to have a civilian oversight committee uh, as part of our city structure, and that we are we are proud to be that progressive LAPD station. I mean, LAPD department that has that, and that, and what an important piece that uh, role that plays in in what we do here in the city. But I also want to just thank you for sharing your experience with working with youth um, as. Um, our chair says it's a very important to me. I have a PALS program where, you know, we have 160 kids some days come through every day, um, uh, obviously in normal times. But these are kids that uh, would ha wouldn't have anywhere to go. They have yeah. parents, and we provide a safe place. And uh, I can honestly say in the 10 years that we built that PALS center, we've really transformed a, a, a neighborhood. And uh, just uh, I, I'm really excited to hear that, uh, that you play a part in that and that you are excited also about youth programs because that's something that's very important to me. So congratulations and uh, uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Mr. I just wanted to say that we also can't forget our, our youth that are 18, you know, the 18 to 22, 24 year olds that have struggled. Um, because of the lack of resources in their community, um, I've seen so many kids fall through the cracks, and I think that that's the hardest population for our law enforcement um, to to work with. So I think that we also need to figure out how to provide a voice and um, and work with 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 um, with that population, whether it's through diversion or restorative justice. But I think it's really important that we not just focus on those kids that already um, are going to the police station and want to, you know, be cadets, but that are also those kids that are the hardest to reach. So um, just want to make sure that, that we um, also focus on that population. And the, and the truth is, due to the pandemic, we know that even more kids are going to have, are uh, going to require, uh, because they didn't have those support services during this year, for those that matriculated uh, to, you know, from junior high to high school or whatever the transition was, or even recent graduates, they've lost out essentially on an almost an entire year of uh, engagement. And so the impact to that population and the need to, uh, to support, you know, to provide that, uh, that critical service to them at this time is, is even more paramount. Uh, but I, I believe Mr. Rue had, uh, Mr. Rue, did you have Question? Well, I just want to say thank you for your service. I want to echo all the sentiments of my, all my colleagues. Um, anyone who wants to serve um, any volunteer capacity, especially for a capacity of this magnitude, uh, we want to say thank you. Um, and everything has been said, and, and uh, your qualifications are stellar, and, and uh, thank you so very much for your service. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. And, and uh, Lou, I just, you know, again, to echo what some of my colleagues have said, and I've, I've, I've had the benefit of knowing you uh, for more than two decades and knowing your work and your commitment, uh, but more importantly, your commitment to work with all sides. Uh, you know, reform is not a conversation to be taken lightly. And when we talk about uh, the fact that, yes, in the city of Los Angeles, we are, uh, you know, miles apart from other municipalities and their structure and their accountability metrics uh, for law enforcement. 
That doesn't mean that we're perfect and it doesn't mean that we're flawless and that we don't need to continue the work. If we didn't need to continue the work, we wouldn't be here right now. So it's all of our responsibilities uh, to both continue to enhance and uh, grow off of the advancements that we've made here locally to be the best and the exemplary uh, model, I think, of policing in the country. And we do that by working with everyone to address where we fail and to and recognize and celebrate where we succeed. And that is the responsibility that we have. And it's a tough, uh, you know, we're dealing with uh, human beings. Mm -hmm. And we are perfect people. But we try to do the best that we can. I know we have some, you know, members of law enforcement that have committed themselves and have served so honorably and that we've both had the privilege of working with. And we need to continue to uplift those that continue to embrace the role and the responsibility that comes with that privilege and continue to support those members of our community who are equally in need of that support. So I want to thank you for, uh, for your uh, commitment to serving in this very critical position. Uh, I believe that you have a, a great balance of perspective from growing up in a community like Ramona Gardens, to your years of service to the City of Los Angeles and our work with youth and with law enforcement. So colleagues, with that, I'd like to uh, recommend the uh, appointment of Ms. Maria Lourdes Lou Calante to the Board of Police Commissioners for the term ending June 30th, 2022. Wow. And Mr. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Oh, yes, Councilmember Rodriguez. Oh, I think we lost her. Uh oh. <laughs> Let's give her a minute to come back. Hey, uh, Councilmember O'Farrell? Aye. Councilmember Buscaino? Aye. Councilmember mm -hmm. Rue? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. And back again to Councilmember Rodriguez? <laughs> Sorry, I got disconnected. Aye. Thank you. Very good. Congratulations, Lou. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you'd please uh, call item number six. Uh, number six, motion Buscano Rodriguez relative to the increase of motor vehicle thefts in 2020. Thank you. Uh, Commander Rimkunas, good to see yeah. you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, so, uh, Mr. Buscano, do you want to go ahead? I know I, I seconded your motion. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, an increase in uh, the number of motor vehicle thefts, but I know this was a motion that uh, you brought forward. I was, I was happy to second this with you. So if you'd like to go ahead, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for partnering with me on, um, on this motion that's now before us. Appreciate uh, police departments are coming forward for their uh, review um, and report. Um, there has been considerable concerns uh, from our, our residents and businesses on the spike of not only uh, property crime but also violent crime. Um, so um, I'd like to get to the violent crime maybe in the separate motion, specifically in, in the South Los Angeles areas where we're seeing spikes in violent crime. Um, but in this case, um, recent reports indicated an increase of theft from motor vehicles, grand theft autos, and I'd like to hear uh, from the department um, their report, and I have a few questions. Sure, okay. Uh, council members, so uh, what I'd like to do is go over um, some numbers with you, because um, that will help paint the picture of where the, the city is at and the department's at. And then I have a five-point power, uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation that can help illustrate graphically of what I'm talking about. So um, I, I, I first want to start out in saying, yes, the city is up about 34%. Uh, we're also up in arrest about 15%. So if you look at where we were, um, you know, as a city, we're still holding at a, approximately about a 9% reduction in overall Part 1 crime. But specifically in regards to motor vehicle theft, um, we've seen an increase in motor vehicle uh, percent. Arrests are up 15%. 
but I like to bring us back to prior to COVID, when we look at a four week extraction period prior to COVID, the city was at a, a negative 2% reduction in motor vehicle theft and arrests were down approximately 7%. And looking at the four geographic bureaus, because I think this helps paint the picture of where the city's at and where the vehicle thefts are occurring. Currently, Operations Central Bureau is up 44% in motor vehicle thefts. They're also up 47% in arrest, which is significant. Uh, prior to COVID, they were even, you know, they across the board, they were even for motor vehicle thefts and down 6.9% in arrest. Operations West Bureau has seen a 38% increase in thefts with a 30% increase in arrest as well. Prior to COVID, they were at a, they were even for motor vehicle thefts and arrests. Operation South Bureau has seen a 24% increase in motor vehicle um, thefts, with a 7.1% increase in arrests. And Operation Valley Bureau has seen a 32% increase in arrests, and they're right under they're about a negative uh, 3% in arrests. Um, it was asked to provide the three top divisions in the city that are experiencing the most um, GPAs. Newton Division is up 47%. So there are about 332 vehicles have been taken in 2020 over 2000 or uh, from 2019. But they're also up 60% in arrest. Prior to COVID, and this is an important note, um, they were at 11% reduction in GTAs. And when I say prior to COVID, that's from a time frame from about March 8th through April 4th. And they were down 12% in arrests. Hollenbeck, again, is high, 46% um, up with a 9.6% uh, in arrests. And Pacific Division is up 47% uh, percent in uh, GTAs with a 45% increase in arrests. At this point, I have a couple slides that I'd like to show you. So I hope I can get this to work here. Um, to help illustrate what, um, let's see your Good entire... luck, and fingers are crossed for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so I think I'll go entire screen, and then I go here. Okay, can everyone see the GTA recovered vehicle analysis? No. No? no? <laughs> uh -oh, okay. Uh-oh, let's see. Oh, maybe I didn't hit share. I got my, my expert here to help me. Just for the record, this is not part of the post certification of uh, <laughs> the state of California. <laughs> oh, that's right. He's not doing it. <laughs> no, but we were going to invite you to help out with the EDC committee next time. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. All right. Maybe we'll give it one more second here. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Well done. Uh-oh. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Almost. There it is. Okay. Okay. So how does that look? Perfect. We, okay. So GTA is a recovered vehicle analysis. So on this slide, I, I, I'll try to walk you through what the numbers mean. You know, uh, obviously vehicles taken with associated rest. And if you look at the, the week ending, those are the week ending of the weeks of the year. So we're at 33 weeks of the year so far. And you look at the weekly mean GTAs on the far left of the column in the comparison, right? So 2019, 309 compared to 411 in 2020. And then that tends to cycle higher as you get into the weeks. Of note is if you look at number 13 at the week ending, you see 328. So COVID was approximately about March 12th when you start to see an increase of vehicles taken um, with associated arrest. Currently, you know, citywide, um, year to date, there's been 13,240 vehicles taken um, in comparison to 9,088. So there's your percentage of about 34% recovered. We've recovered 10,000 784 vehicles. So our recovery rate is about 81% uh, right now. So I think this slide, I just wanted um, the council members to be able to see graphically of how the increase has gone up with the um, average number of arrests increasing. So any, any questions on this? And I got a couple more slides that I can run through. Let's go ahead. Okay. 
Um, so here's our GTA arrest comparison. The blue is obviously the COVID-19. And you can see the spike, again, that this just be better illustrates from weeks 15 through 33. Um, for those specific weeks, we're up 15% um, over 2019. So that's pretty significant for LAPD. Historically, I, I have not seen these numbers with the amount of vehicles taken and the amount of arrests and, and with arrests come pursuits and things like that. So everything is up across the board. So that's what this slide illustrates. The next slide is recovered vehicles. I think this is important that on the column to the left here, police areas, um, I should have put the divisions in there, but 13 is Newton Division. I'll just do the top, the five here. 13 is Newton Division. 12 is 77th Division. Four is Hollenbeck Division. 19 is Mission. And 16 is Foothill. So you can see the amount of vehicles that have been found. So within Newton Division, there's 14% of the total number of stolen vehicles um, have been recovered in Newton Division. And as you see, the numbers sort of slide down, um, you know, to the various uh, police areas. So, Commander, when, when it shows the recovery there, uh, what, where's the, do you have a point of origination? Yes. So, oh. so on the next slide here, um, the, um, so if you look at the area taken is number, okay, so here's the police numbers again. I apologize for not having the divisions listed in um, as their name. But then you go across areas uh, where stolen was found. So this this is important, and I just want you know what stands out to me is if you look at say um, for Mr. Uh, Buscaino, if you look at Harbor Division, you know you look at area taken number five. Yeah, it's nearly ninety percent. Right, area. Yeah, is two fifty three. But an interesting note of in my research and my talking with. Um, you know, the captains and, and Chief Scott at uh, South Bureau, Holland, or Harbor Division stolens, the, I'm not going to, I mean, there's about 30 to 40 percent of the stolens are recovered. I mean, the, I mean, the majority are recovered, 80 percent are recovered in, in Harbor, but their family members taking vehicles. And this is all during the spike to where you have multiple families sharing vehicles, not sharing vehicles and used for transportation. But that was a, a, a interesting fact pattern that, that I, I found working with Harbor division that you have folks that are family members and family members can mean a lot of things for, for different people, but they're, they're, they're vehicles that are being taken and then they're, they're, they're used for transportation to do something um, crime is involved, but sometimes it's just for strictly mere of convenience, and then they're recovered within the same general area. So that was pretty significant. And then if you look across the board um, at you know at the various police divisions, the ninety per ninety eight percent of these the area taken is where the area in which it was recovered. Um, so you know the analysis leads to believe that because of COVID, there's more vehicles that have been parked. There's more opportunities for folks that have needed transportation that have, you know, of, of, of not going to, uh, what we've identified as a problem is key fobs, shave keys, keys left in vehicles like Pacific, for instance. If you look at Pacific, they have a lot of um, exterior parking uh, rental facilities around the airport. So talking to Captain Morrison, their, you know, vehicle, rental vehicles have not been used for long periods of time, but the rental companies haven't had place to store all the keys, so they leave keys in the vehicles at the rental lots, and then you look at the, with the zero bail, with um, multiple repeat offenders, I, I'll tell you in a second, um, after I finish this slide about the repeat offenders and the multiple arrests of folks, it's been, it's been pretty mm -hmm. significant, but um Okay, so any questions on this, and then I'll get back to, to, to normal here. So aside from, if I can, Madam Chair, aside from um, the family disputes per se, yes. are we finding any of these what we call joyriding out in the street? Yes. Oh, yeah. From our debriefs of arrestees, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of juveniles involved. Um, what, what we've discovered, and again, this is working through the detectives at the areas, is that the folks know that, you know, you get arrested, you're right out the door. We've had multiple um, individuals that have been arrested 
and I can share a story. There's an individual that was sold a car from Pacific Division. He rolled the car on Venice on the off ramp right there. He lost his arm in the in the pursuit. And then he's let out. He 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 gets fixed up in the hospital within three days, and he's back again, arrested four days later after he's released from the hospital in another stolen car. He's been arrested four times in a matter of weeks, and you know that's not the. I mean, that tends to be that folks understand that there's no time. They're they're the site back dates are went from like sixty to one hundred and twenty days, if at that. So. You know, there's really not a big penalty for Grand Theft Auto. And that's sort of the truth of the matter here, you know, from what we've seen. But that's why you're seeing these uh, these significant numbers of arrests, you know, 60 percent in Newton Division for arrest. I was the captain there for four years and I've never seen that, um, you know, in just, uh, uh, you know, in this March to, to July. I would like to say that, um, you know, if we look at. What you're saying, Commander, they're not being held accountable for their actions. There's hardly any consequences here in our area that if you steal a car, you'll be let out within the next day or two. Is that what Correct, you're sir. telling me? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And how much of, would you attribute to these repeat offenders from those who've been released from jail or prisons due to COVID-19? So I'm going to find my notes here. So, so, so just from a number standpoint and my calculations here, citywide – out of total of arrests, we have 346 repeat offenders. OVB, 47. OCB, 65. OSB, Operation South Bear, 185. And OWB, 49. That's Can you huge. repeat that again, please? Oh, yeah, uh, yes. So, so in my calculations here, so citywide, we have about 346 repeat offenders. Um, Operations Valley Bureau, 47. Uh, OCB, 65. OSB, Operation South Bureau 185 and OWB is 49. Thank you. And then just 77th Division in itself has 158 of the 346. Um, so, you know, it, it's uh, – there's wow. there's folks that are out there committing these crimes, and, and, and I can't say we're not doing what, you know, what we can to try to – Clearly, you guys are making arrests. It's incredible with these arrest numbers. Yeah, I haven't seen it, you know, in my time on, on you know, within this organization. I mean, the, I, the numbers are very, very high for such a small window of time, you know. And, again, there's many, you know, like we said, COVID and, and parking and key fobs. And, you know, the, the difference of these stolen vehicles, you know, west side's a little bit different than south, you know, than the south side. But, you know, you have delivery folks that are delivering meals to people where they're leaving their vehicles running and then cars are being taken. And, it just, it just, that's compiled now because folks have stayed at home and you get more delivery services, not even your true um, Ubers and Grubhubs and things like that. It's just folks trying to make a living, trying to then maneuver and, and, and uh, um, deliver food, you know, to, to, to make some money. So, Commander, what would otherwise be the hold for uh, an arrest associated with GTA? So, so I'm happy to say, so what we've done now because the zero bail – so there's the bail deviation, which I, I – so where the, the auto detectives are calling commissioners and judges and then asking for a deviation of the zero bail. So that's worked. Like last week, we deviated 18 cases. And in Newton Division, because of the bail deviation for multiple arrests and criminal history and things like that, the judges are granting – allotting some bail, which is keeping folks – in jail for a little bit amount of time. So that's helped, you know, which, which I think has contributed since this is the end of July into August, well, no, well, July into August, uh, we have seen about a 12 to 14% reduction in GTAs. And that's obviously because folks are out and about working um, and doing things where they weren't probably in mid-March through uh, July. And then, I had to step away for a minute, but thank you. Madam Chair, if I can, lastly, uh, what are we doing on the um, on educating the community? Uh, my last ride along at Harbor Division, we, we saw a kid leave his uh, his key and his ignition running while he ran into the liquor store and sure the car was gone. They thankfully we recovered it, so it falls in line with your stats three blocks away. So, what are we doing on the whole lock it or lose it um, campaign that? Um, the department has launched uh, years ago. 
So traditionally, you know, I think we are hindered a little bit because, you know, one of the biggest things that we would do, there would be donations of club devices where you would see a pocket of, say, where there's been a, been a, a, a uptick of GTAs where we would go hand out club devices. Um, we've been a little restricted. You know, we're doing, you know, community meetings, Zoom calls. There are slows are doing what they can when they're out in the field, continually educating trying to um, still work in the general areas and, and personally packing out devices. Um, so that's been the educational effort I don't think has stopped. I believe it's just the amount of vehicles and the involvement of, of, of folks um, and the availability of the vehicles that has created this significant increase in GTAs because that is the only crime that we're up in, you know, all, you know, all other property crime were, were, were at reductions still, but we're continually asking our folks roll calls, you know, obviously they're making arrests. They have the right vehicles. They're, they're doing what they can to stop, but obviously arresting and pursuits is not what we want. You know, we want the community to maybe take a little bit of ownership in this and, and we're doing what we can to still obtain funding, you know, uh, outside funding from various donors to purchase the devices to help people. Like Hondas are still our number one vehicle. For years, it's been Hondas. Like right now, that's about 20% um, of the stolen vehicles that are taken. So the club devices, you know, that's big. You know, each division has those devices, I hope, um, to be passing those out when they identify certain clusters of, of, of uh, GTA crimes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commander. Um, colleagues, any other questions? No? Um, well, thank you, Commander. Very uh, enlightening. And uh, for the uh, deviation cases, I think obviously that proves a success. So if we can continue on that track, um, but clearly a, a, a lot of uh, preventative work uh, that the community can be involved with that would help uh, reduce and contribute. You know, when we talk about our numbers, and, and we have to remind the public how much their involvement is really required in, talk, in when we talk about improved public safety in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, they are, in fact, part of the solution, and law enforcement can't do it alone. So, uh, you know, let's not create an impossible task uh, by creating scenarios and environments that provide that opportunity uh, very easily for these types of incidents. But... Um, Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the your presentation skills. Well done with your PowerPoint. A little bit uh, of help. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Uh, so, colleagues, would like to go ahead and recommend that we note and file this motion. And uh, thank you, and uh, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember O'Farrell. Aye. Councilmember Buscaino. Aye. Councilmember Rue. Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Very good. Perfect. And so now that brings us to item number five for Mr. Busseno. Item number five, motion, Harris Dawson, Wesson Price Rodriguez, relative to investigating the swatting incident that occurred on Wednesday, August 12, 2020, targeting Dr. Melina Abdullah, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter LA. Thank you, thank you, Madam um, Chair. And, and uh, this is, uh, let, me, let me be clear, the swatting uh, incidents, of course, indicate clear, clear uh, criminal harassment tactic of defeat, receiving an emergency service um, means it's a hoax and, and it puts not only the, uh, the residents as well as public safety in danger um, by false reporting specifically in, in targeting high profile folks as the one uh, incident before us here. Um, just wanted to um, ask, I don't know if we have staff on the line. Um, is this something that um, the department automatically investigates these incidents regardless of we put forward a council motion or not? Should be Harry, is Harry still on? Harry, Harry was on. I see him, but I—he's me. There he is. Okay. Hi, Councilman. Uh, yeah, this would be something that we would we would conduct an investigation on, irrespective of uh, who the victim is. And I'd like to just hear. I'd like to know maybe in the report back, Madam Chair, if you're okay with it, just to to see how many swatting incidents 
uh, the Depar police department has handled year to date, maybe over the course of the last uh, year. Uh, we've seen a growing trend um, uh, of swatting incidents in the city of Los Angeles, regardless of uh, if the person's high profile or not. Uh, if you're okay with that, I'd like to hear more, uh, because again, uh, it's just uh, asinine to, to know that these incidents are occurring. It, it, we're hopeful that um, this, these types of incidents lead to the arrest and prosecution of such acts, and uh, hoping that um, we can get those answers back to us. Of course. We'll include that in the report, Council. Thank you. Terrific. Um, Mr. Roof. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, uh, I just want to echo Councilmember Buscaino's sentiments. Uh, this is um, um, unacceptable, and it is, um, as Councilmember Buscaino said, an uh, asinine situation where uh, I look forward to the investigation because this is, um, especially in this current climate, it is dangerous. Um, and, you know, and whoever did this, uh, they might think it's funny. They might think uh, uh, they were trying to prove a point, but um, in reality, it is not funny and it is dangerous. As a matter of fact, I know even our former colleagues, uh, our current colleagues, Councilmember Paul Koretz, uh, was also swatted on. And, um, and you know, this could easily um, go south quickly, so this is not uh, a funny situation. This is a serious situation and also withdrawals uh, the, the much valuable police resources uh, from those incidences that require their attention. So I look forward to this report, and um, I hope this goes to a warning to everyone else that this is not acceptable and, and they will be prosecuted. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Harry, for uh, being available. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, recommend the approval. And so, Mr. Uh, Clerk, if you'd please call the roll. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember O'Farrell? Aye. Councilmember Buscaino? Aye. Councilmember Rue? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. I believe uh, we have cleared the desk. We have cleared the desk, ma'am. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.